Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 22 of the Sinsha podcast. Uh, my name, of course, is the Mighty Pong. I'm Crux. And, I'm Sean. Uh, and our special guest today is Sean. And we're going to be talking to him here in just a little bit uh, about uh, he, uh, Sean is in the middle of converting a Ford Transit into a mobile home. And it's going to be super cool. We got all kinds of pictures to show you, all kinds of stuff. So in the chat, uh, guys, if you've got any uh, comments, anything you want to see us ask him, uh, you know, definitely uh, speak up and let us know. And we'd be more than happy to uh, get those questions answered for you. Uh, but before we go there, uh, this is, of course, the Sin Shop podcast. First an announcement on the shop. We are located at uh, 1075 American Pacific Drive, Suite C in Henderson, Nevada. Now, unless you're a member, you're going to have to wait a little bit to come out to, to come check out the shop. We're currently closed to the public for now, but uh, we would like to remind you that while we are closed to the public, if you are in a shared space elsewhere, make sure that you clean your tools, your surfaces, and material before and after you use them. Do what you can to limit exposure to yourself and others. Stay home, don't touch your face, and for Pete's sake, wash your damn hands. Everyone's going a little stir crazy by now, but due to those that have done their part, we're helping to keep ourselves and others safe as businesses gradually are allowed to reopen and the outside world becomes a little bit less pandemic-y. Uh, let's keep pushing forward and eventually we're going to come out the other side on this. Now to stay updated on the shop's open status, check out sinshop.org forward slash COVID status and you can find out the latest information. And to make sure that you're notified of our future events, including virtual ones like this or tour dates at the shop, you can check out meetup.com forward slash sin shop. And with that, I'm finally going to take a breath and introduce our guest. Uh, so this is uh, uh, Sean. And uh, you've, uh, how long have you been a member at the shop? I've uh, been a member not that long, only since uh, I think February or January, February is when I kind of joined up. Very cool. Very cool. When, when did you find out about the shop? Uh, since just about day one, back in, I think, 2011 or 12 or something, I had a, a friend of mine was a member, and I kind of tagged along with him because we had similar interests. And I think, you know, I think the shop bot may have still been in boxes. I think there was a bridge port being shoved into place. And, you know, I just kind of tagged along to help push stuff around a little bit. And I was in the midst of traveling and quitting my job and kind of I was out of town more than I was in town. So it just didn't work out for me to join up at the time. Wow. Okay. So then how did this, how, well, I guess we'll, we'll get into the project here in, in just a second, but so you've been uh, only a member since you know, February or March, you said? Yeah. Yeah. So what's your favorite thing about the shop then? Honestly, one of the favorite things is more of a surprise than anything. It's, the, it's access to scraps. Um, you know, it's one of those things when you're, when you're on kind of a project that kind of covers the whole spectrum of you know, metal work, wood work, electronics work, everything, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you need to make four brackets and they're made and you want them out of stainless steel and you can find some stainless out of you know, the scrap pile, you know, you can make them in an hour. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if you're trying to do it in your home shop, you've got to make a trip downtown and it turns into a multi-day project. So honestly, having access to, to scraps, metal scraps, so we lost you briefly. I, uh, you were at uh, we uh, having access to metal scraps is where where it glitched out. Oh, sorry. Yeah, connection's going a bit weird. Having access to metal, wood, all those scraps that's that's been by far the biggest surprise. Absolutely. Well, that's that, that's awesome. I love hearing uh, each 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 time we have a guest. I love hearing what it is about the uh, about the shop that they like. It's it's funny you mentioned that. I had a similar thing. When, uh, when I was younger, my dad was an auto mechanic and he, any bolt that he needed, he could turn around, rummage in some bread pans and he would come back with a bolt that would fit like any time. Like I never had that fail. Like, oh, it's a transmission bolt for a, you know, 1980s MR2. You know, I think I got something that's going to fit that. Hang on. And he, <laughs> and he would go and, and rummage around and he'd come back with it every single time. So yeah, no, having access to, to that kind of thing is, is just is just awesome. So what is it that, you, so for a career, you're actually in production. Like, is it, was it print or, or TV or news or? Uh, in my background is software development. So I work for a media publication company. So I manage most, the, the biggest part of my job is kind of managing our IT infrastructure, um, more on the software side, but kind of, you know, software as a service type stuff, you know, yeah. AWS stack and all that. 
Um, you know, these days I have to play more of a manager role than anything. So mm-hmm. only about 30% of the time do I get to actually, you know, put on the headphones for the day and write any code. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, news, traditional news, you know, everything from newspaper, magazines to TV station to radio, everything. So we, we kind of, we're all over the board. Oh, that's awesome. So, cause I was wondering about that. Cause this project that you've got here with the, the vans, this is to live in, right? This isn't to just kind of hang out and as an RV. This is a, this is like home. Is that true or? That yeah. Is... Um, oh, okay. Right now it's, it's, you know, I, I kind of lived a goofy life, you know, living in houses here and there. I mean, I've, you know, not been a van dweller, I guess, for most of my life, but only about the last year and a half did I, you know, I've had a van since I think 2012 mm-hmm. off and on. And then mostly as, you know, summer travels, weekend travels, holidays, and then, um, you know, a bit of a life change last, you know, about a year and a half ago. And I thought, well, I've already, I already owned one. So time to load up the dog and yeah, head North for the summer and, and, you know, just see what it was, see what it'd be like to actually make it a full-time thing. And, um, and you know, it's awfully tough to go back to paying, paying rent or paying a mortgage, mortgage payment. I'm sure it is. Yeah. I mean, especially being so, so fortunate to have a job where you can just, you know, Hey, I'm going to go to Seattle today. Hey, I'm going to go to Oregon tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like being able to do that and keep employment. That's, that's, that's a gift. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly, you know, there, there's definitely a community out there of people who get remote jobs and just decide to get rid of everything and just hit the road. I mean, there's, there's a Reddit, uh, van dwellers subreddit. There's, um, you know, it, I'm a big rock climber and, you know, a big part of the rock climbing community is people living in their cars and, yeah. you know, everything from like the ultimate dirt baggers just scraping by on their, you know, 30 year old Camry to, you know, people in mega vans. I mean, they're, you know, it's kind of a, it's an, it's an interesting and mostly welcoming crowd of just, you know, people just, you know, minimize, minimizing their kind of, you know, the essential part of their life just to pursue what they want to do and yeah. they want to go they want to go sleep down by the river and go fishing every day, then that's all the better. Yeah. Yeah. I saw one show a long time ago. Uh, it was about tiny houses and a guy actually got a train car and, and made, it was like an old sleeper car, I think. And he made an entire house out of it with, with hardwood floors and a kitchen and a bathroom and all this stuff. And he just pays the different train companies to take him to a different city. I was like, I, I mean, I guess you're, Dang shipping yourself as cargo i don't know if union pacific will let you do that but apparently he does i don't know but it, yeah it, i mean it's, i think that's how those work you like you can technically own a train car kind of like a, as an investment and then yeah what you put in it's up to you or if you don't put anything in it i guess exactly yeah <laughs> well i mean I, I have a feeling that uh wherever the shop goes in the future we're probably not going to have access to rail so you know we'll see you never no, know. You're not far off. You're only about a block away from it. I know. Yeah. So, so did the fact that you were going to be living in it lead to any different design choices? Yeah. I mean, there's always compromises no matter what. Um, you know, I, this is my third van. Um, and so the first two I built, uh, I was living in a house and it was my, my ex-girlfriend and I, she was a school teacher and I, I worked a flexible schedule mm-hmm. um, and sometimes contract work. So I would follow, you know, I would take two or three months off during the summer and it was, you know, we would spend significant time in it, but um, you know, it wasn't a full, full time thing. You know, I always had like a, a house or a storage unit to go back to, to, to swap out stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so I've been living in van number two for, for about a year and a half. Um, and you know, it's, it's one of those things, you know, I, I went North for as long as I could. Um, and then once the snow started, started coming down, you know, I had to come back down and hit my storage unit and start over again. I was, I was switching over to the, uh, to some screenshots here to share of, uh, of the first two vans. This is just a couple of pictures. So right now I've got a picture up of the very first one. Okay, so finally, yeah, from what I've heard of fiberglass is like at first it's fun. Oh, I'm going to make everything out of fiberglass, and then it's like, no, this really sucks, and and you try to avoid <laughs> it at all costs. I actually heard literally the opposite. So my dad would would not do two things with cars. He would not ever touch transmissions. It's just too big of a pain in the ass, and he would never touch a uh, bodywork because fiberglass, no thank you. Like I don't know if it was a thing where like 
he kept smoothing it until it no longer looked like a car or, you know, or, or what the problem was. But I do have our screenshots back. So anyway, up on the, on the main screen here, I've got uh, just the just two little pictures of the inside of, of this is version one here. Um, showing just the little the little sink and cabinets. So this is all handmade by you as well, right? Yeah, everything in there. That was a 2004 Sprinter. Um, yeah, this was kind of a yeah, this is kind of a leap into the unknown. I had been I had a little like 2001 Ford Escape for years and years before that. Did plenty mm -hmm. of travels. Did plenty of long long term travels in it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's always a case of, you know, you want to go to bed, you got to move the kitchen, you want to make coffee, you got to move the bed, you're, you're always shuffling stuff all day. Yeah. Um, and I had entertained the idea of trying to build out like a little, uh, you know, it was like white box kind of, you know, garden service trailers, getting one of those and building out a little homemade RV or mm. making the jump into the van world. I think that was 20, maybe 2012 or 13 or something. Very cool. And so I found a, you know, kind of a mildly rusted out sprinter in Connecticut um you know it was the guy was desperate to move and he kept dropping the price on me and as before long it was something i couldn't refuse so yeah um you know flew out there with about a two-day notice and picked it up and brought it back and just kind of a you know i had you know i had hand tools and a driveway and it was just kind of what i could build in the driveway and that was about it wow um you know pretty simple you know it was something i wanted to get done quick and simple and you know it's just very little anything powered you know i had a i had a Oh, uh, kind of a chest style fridge. It was a compressor fridge, so it'd still actually get stuff cold. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, a hand powered water pump, a little propane stove, and some basic LED lights, and that was about it. Nice. Okay, so then I see on number two, the, you kept what's interesting about version two. That's what we're that's what's up on the screen right now. You'll probably see it come up on yours shortly. But on uh, on version number two, I noticed that the sink moved from one wall to the other. Yeah. So. You know, I, I'd seen some designs. Um, you know, I've never really seen anybody do a design like I've done it mm -hmm. exactly. But, you know, I draw inspiration from from everywhere. And I got to realizing that, you know, the, the side door, the big slider door, you know, it is sized for a pallet. You know, these are cargo vans. They're, they're meant to be big enough for a pallet. Right. Um, I thought, you know, that's, that's a whole lot of space that I don't necessarily need to preserve all of it. Mm. Um, and so a kitchen was something that I could easily kind of vary how much I kicked it out into the door. Um, you know, my second van and third third van, they both kick out into the door a little bit, but different amounts, just depending on kind of how much how much room I want to take up, how how constricted I want the door to be. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of, yeah, I mean that's one of the big that's one of the big uh like pivotal points in my design is, you know, starting to cut the wood to fit that. It's like, well do I want it 13 inches? Do I want it 15 inches? Do I want it nine inches? Like kind of like all of it would be okay, but uh -huh. I was just trying to like think far enough down the road down the road to just just imagine how annoying something's going to be. Like, oh man, um, like I'm starting to cut lumber now. This now it's real. Is, is that kind of thing. Yeah, when when you buy a you know two hundred dollar countertop and you make that cut, it's like, well, I'm not really in the mood to buy another one. Mm. Yeah, no kidding. I'm 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 betting that's one of those you know measure a hundred times cut, hopefully only once. Yeah, there are a handful of those cuts. Oh, well, I think one of them we'll talk about later. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think we will. I think we will. I know. I know which one definitely makes me the most concerned. Okay. So, uh, so now we're here at the beginning of this version. It's the one with the uh, black plastic interior, and it looks like is this like a day one? This is from the dealer. Bought one new, so I always buy them used. Um, oh, okay. I mean, I, I don't think I'll ever buy a new car for the rest of my life. I mean, just wait for someone else to buy it and turn around a week later and buy it from them, and you'll save $10,000. You're not wrong. Um, but, um, yeah, so the the second one I found, I found it in uh, you know, a town about an hour outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, and the story, I found it at a dealer, but the story was it was like a, the dealer's dealership owner's brother or something he ran for fedex he ran a private vehicle for fedex mm -hmm. um, and he did nothing but run coast to coast um trying actually i'm trying to see that photo i don't well this one might be number three i don't remember which van this is uh so um, on the stream right now you're what you're looking at is that was uh from earlier i don't know why there's uh there seems to be a lot of lag going on right now uh the, you're, yeah, you're probably about 20 yeah, seconds a minute lag. yeah yeah actually probably closer to a minute However long we were down earlier, that's that's about how much lag. Hey, um, there you go. Yeah, so van, so van number two was, I bought it at a dealership, 
but it was uh it was used i bought it with like ninety four thousand miles on i mean it was only it was like a year and four months old but the guy just basically ran like critical fedex loads coast to coast just nothing but highway miles mm -hmm. um and you know i've i've taken it i put another fifty thousand miles on it with you know next to no issue yeah um and uh you know it was just time to build another one you know i just like building them and now that i'm full-time i wanted a new one so the the third one it's kind of a you know it, it took a little bit of a leap of faith to buy it because it was it, there was some oddball scenario around you know the, the backstory to the van it was a van you know they're all built in kansas city but mm -hmm. it was sold to the canadian market it was imported back into the u.s by a company or like a dealership in minnesota and then a couple a young couple in their 30s um they had bought it to build out and they were in florida hmm. and they had they had just kind of cleaned it up but then they changed their mind and they were working at a they were doing something with taking part ownership or something of like a like an organic fruit farm and they decided you know the van thing wasn't for them right now so it was it was one of those things when you look at the backstory of the van you're like well like I don't know. It sounds a little weird, but you know, maybe there, maybe it's all good faith. Right. Um, but it was, it was a decent price, low miles. It had like 25,000 miles on it. It was a 2018. Yeah. Um, it looked pretty immaculate. Um, how many, how many it was one of those things? How many thousand? I'm kinda... oh, sorry. How many thousand were on it? 25. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. That's not bad at all. Yeah. So, and it was, it was the exact van I was looking for. It was the tall one, the extended one. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's it's like three feet longer than the van, my number two van, yep. which has its issues. But uh, I thought it'd just be really fun to try to build out a an extra long one just to kind of see see what it's like to have that much room. Oh yeah. Even though it does kind of constrain where I can go and you know kind of some of the backcountry roads I can go down. Oh that, um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you can't really take it off roading, can you? I haven't yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, you can, but you know, bring along recovery boards, but you know. It's yep. like speaking of off roading. Well, surprise where you get vehicles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> off road. Yeah. Yeah. You can you can definitely get vehicles off road that have no business being there, that's for sure. In, in uh, my earlier days of taking a Pontiac Sunfire off road, and it was not an off road vehicle. <laughs> mm, no, not really. No, not so much. It, a little different story when your vehicle's 10 feet tall and, you know, yeah, 20 feet yeah. long and, and it weighs a little more. And, you know, I've, I always travel with a big recovery line and I come along and, but in the desert, there's not often things to pull yourself from. So no, no there's not. So, uh, up right now is probably a picture of it, uh, stripped out on the inside. Um, how, so what, what's with the boards on the bottom? It looks like that's you putting it down a subfloor. Yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, I try at all cost uh, to avoid adding holes, um, just because, you know, if you're if you want to be careful and you want to prevent rust, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you add a hole, you need to clean it up, uh, deburr it, prime it, paint it, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. See you later. Um, so I try to avoid adding any holes. You know, the the one thing I really like about the transit is along the walls and like the subframe under the van. Mm -hmm. um, it is just littered with factory holes. A lot of them, a lot of them on the subframe even have like tap threads in them. So all you have to do oh. is just Maybe maybe run a tap in them to clean out the gravel, and then you know just bolt things on. Oh, that's um, cool. And, um, but what you're seeing there is, you know, there's no way to attach anything to the floor. Mm -hmm. um, so what I did in the second van that is, you know, now three or four years on has proven really well uh, to work out really well is, um, basically I just get like you know liquid nails kind of stuff, just like construction adhesive, and just glue the heck out of the you know a subfloor. Oh wow! Um, just glue those things down, and you know, uh, I think that's paint cans holding them down or something, just mm -hmm. to kind of give it a little bit of pressure to to keep them in place. Um, and then once those are glued, you know, I hit them with a hammer and you know, kind of go through and stress test them to make sure they actually stuck. And then once once I'm confident, then I start building on them. Oh yeah, because that would suck. You have everything in 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 the van and everything, and you you know your first time out, and you walk you know walk in the back, and you hear a little squeak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, God damn it! So yeah. yeah, no, yeah, you definitely want to want to get rid of that. So that's you pulled actually into the back of the shop. I recognize that uh, that garage door anywhere. Yep. Very cool. Yeah, and that stack of paint cans is still there, still still there on the shelves. Yeah. And then, uh, so the next one we got here is uh, looks like you've got the uh, I guess the underlayment down. 
So did you, we were, we were going to get to the, the flooring later. I'm surprised that the pictures are here, but anyway, uh, so what kind of, of, well, you know, let's, let's see if we get to the actual flooring stuff here. Oh no. Okay, cool. Solar panel stuff. So one thing that I, I noticed uh, as I was going through, you know, all, all the different pictures was a lot of the brackets that you made are custom. And you talked about that earlier. You're like, oh, I need a stainless steel. What's it to go here and all that. And there's scrap over here. Um, so is, was that out of necessity or was, you know, because they don't make those parts or was that a cost saving thing? Or was that just a like, hey, I can make it. I got stainless steel right here, you know. Uh, kind of a, you know, kind of the, the, the cross of all of those. Um you know so like the i don't know the black oh, what the brackets there that's on the metal band saw so basically i wanted c brackets for fabricating a solar rack mm -hmm. um there's a company that makes such a thing and on my van number two i actually purchased them mm -hmm. um and i swear the price has gone up or something because they're they're like they were like 32 dollars per bracket or something and i just happened to need eight of them oh that's crazy so and and uh you know they're they're meant for they're meant for supporting like a roof rack for la like a ladder rack or something and you know, they're they're like weather guard or something you know kind of for the construction and um the industry hmm. and you know i think i'd even i think i'd even had them in my cart or maybe even placed an order um you know i may oh that's what it was you know i actually did have them ordered um but that was right when all the pandemic stuff happened uh -huh. and you know i placed an order you know Three, you know, a few hours later, I got an email saying, you know, we're we're shipping out of New York. We've been banished from the warehouse. Uh, we'll send you an email when we can ship them or you're welcome to cancel. So wow. that's when I went back and I was like, well, who knows when they'll show up? And I would really like to get this stuff done now. So I went rummaging and found that, uh, you know, square tubing or whatever it was and started hacking stuff together. And once I got confident that they might work, I went and canceled my order and went with it. Very cool. Are those powder coated or, or is that sprayed? No, it's sprayed. So it's kind of like an etching, etching primer, and then just sprayed with a few coats of black. Very cool. I found a uh, a long time ago. I found a, a powder coater that uh, Sears used to sell, and it looks like uh, the body of a screw gun, and it's got like little contacts on the base, and then a little chamber that holds your your powder coat. You know your your powder, I guess. Uh, you know you hold it in there, and it'll blow air through it. And there's a little attachment that you hook onto your work and the paint, you know, the powdered paint just sucks right to it. You put it in a toaster oven for, I don't remember how long, but you put it in a toaster oven until it's painted and it's done. Like, and it's on there. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. And if I could powder coat or anodize, the, the, that would be you know, the golden ticket. Absolutely. Yeah, there's not actually a whole lot involved with powder coating other than, you know, space, obviously, for whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um you know, a lot of things, toaster oven is not going to be big enough, so you, you're going to need a larger oven, but. You can do these one at a time. <laughs> yeah. And I'll just, you know, if you gotta, you know. So I and, think there is a toaster oven at the shop. But there is, there is. We got, well, we I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it for food, but. No. Because uh, <laughs> I think it's been used for like leaded solder, but. Absolutely. Yeah. No, uh, there's no way I'd cook anything on anything in the shop. Um. <laughs> So here's, uh, we got a shot right now of the actual panels. Uh, I was going to ask you about those. So, so did you design the panels and the charger and all that other stuff? Or was that, you know, completely homemade or, or what was, how was your solar thing put together? How'd you do that? I mean, nothing comes as a kit. Um, you know, I, everything's componentized and, you know, I kind of figure out, you know, what my needs are from experience and, you know, hopes and dreams and, uh, you know, kind of put together, you know, what I feel like affording at the time. And, you know, on this van I have, uh, on the new one, I have 400 watts of solar. So I found, yeah, I, I guess on the roof, my big constraint was I learned, I learned on van two that I liked having two roof vents and I wanted to do two on the new one. Mm -hmm. um, just because I've got, I travel with a dog and, you know, if I'm, if, you know, somewhere that's, you know, not 110 degrees out. If it's, you know, 80 degrees out, you know, I want to be able to leave the dog in there, turn the vent fans on and know that it's going to stay nice and cool. Yeah. Um, um, so I like having that. And so the big constraint on the roof is uh, the fans. Mm -hmm. um, on the on the van number two, I had two fans and then I ran three 100 watt panels side to side between them. Hmm. Um, and the thing that frustrated me about that is I just eliminated all useful roof space. You know, there was a bunch of wasted space 
towards the front and a bunch behind it, but I couldn't use any of it. Mm -hmm. And so my objective with this van was I wanted to run all panels down one side if I could, leave the other side open for, you know, a future toy, kayak, something, whatever. You know, just leave space that's still usable somehow. Okay. Um, and so, you know, I got the vents in, you know, just started measuring around and then just surfing the internet until I until I found panels that looked like they might fit up there good enough without, you know, without overhanging the side too much and, and giving me enough space or enough power. So I think these are rich solar 200 watt panels, um, two 200 watt panels. Mm -hmm. So it gives me 400 watts uh, and they, they fit down one side. You know, I'm still going to have a little bit of wasted space right down the center between the vents. You know, in an ideal world, if I could find like the perfect solar panel to fit that space, I would add another 100 watts there. But, you know, it's they only come in so many sizes. Yeah. So what all is run off of there? Do you run a refrigerator off of it or, you know? Yeah, so it's a Danfoss compressor fridge. It's, uh, you know, they're all kind of made by Dometic, which is a, it's a big company in the RV world, but it's an Italian company that makes a... Uh, it's called like a swing compressor or something. I forget, I forget all the exact terminology, but it's a low surge start compressor. So it doesn't have like a spike surge like your you know, home fridge compressor does. Got it. Okay. Uh, so it's a DC, DC compressor. Um, you know, when it's running, it only draws like three amps DC. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's a big fridge. It's full cabinet height, you know, 30, whatever, 33 inches. Yeah. Um, and it's got a freezer compartment. So that's, that's kind of the big constant draw in year round. Um, I've also got a heater that it's it, it burns gasoline to produce heat, but it, you know it uses electricity to run the blower, run the glow plugs, everything. Mm -hmm. um, in the winter, that's the big draw. Um, when it's running, it doesn't draw much. It only draws like 0. 0.7 amps or something. Okay. Um, it's just if you're at that wrong temperature where it's having to cycle up and down again over and over, huh. um, it's the glow plugs. They they'll draw like 10 to 12 amps every time those glow plugs have to kick on and get get it ignited. So it's more um, efficient the colder it is. Yeah, it is. If you can, huh. if you can, I mean, oftentimes if, if you're kind of at that shoulder season where it's not cold enough, it's actually more efficient to open up the vent fans and suck cold air in just so the heater has to work a little harder wow. and will actually run more efficient. So that reminds me, I lived in a, in a, in a, an apartment in the nineties, early nineties, something like that in St. Louis that was in, that was built for the 1904 world's fair. Uh, for the Spanish ambassadors, which, you know, at the t in 1904, it was, <laughs> but in 1995, it was crap hole, but uh, they, it still had steam heat. And so that is the hottest heat I've ever had. We, it would be the middle of St. Louis winter, like 10 degrees below zero. And we had the windows open because <laughs> the, the steam heat was so flipping powerful. You had to, or else you would just, just swelter. It was crazy. But uh, that, yeah, that's like it can even turn off, or is it just on all the time? Oh, there's there's valves that are made of metal <laughs> on on the radiator that's really hot. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna open the window. <laughs> Windows are made of wood and they're cold, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take that one. So uh, I included this one. This was originally uh, an old, a picture that was further in your list. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Before we go any further, I, I forgot. We're a little bit past the top of the hour here. So uh, that means that it is time for me to take a brief moment and uh, and let you guys know. Again, we're, we're talking with Sean here from, uh, from Sean Stoops from the shop. Uh, he's a uh, Sin Shop member, and he is in the middle of, trans, uh, of converting a tr Ford Transit into a home. And uh, we're, we're basically going through some of that. The Sin Shop, of course, is located at 1075 American Pacific Drive, Suite C, and that's in Henderson, Nevada. To find out more about the shop, go to sinshop.org. Uh, and to find out more about, inf uh, to find more information about upcoming uh, events that the shop is putting on, go to meetup.com forward slash Sin Shop. Also, we are going to have a post game at the bottom of the hour, and we're going to uh, uh, be talking a little bit more with Sean if, if you're able to stick around. Yeah. Awesome. Of course. Sounds good. Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit more about, uh, about his van and his project and all that stuff. Uh, so yeah, make sure you stick around with us for the post game and, uh, and that's, and it's going to be a good time. So yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, there was something else. Oh yeah. Uh, we do want to remind you, uh, to, uh, if you are watching, you like what you see, uh, please do subscribe, ring the bell. It's, uh, you know, follow like et, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and leave comments. We definitely do read the comments. If you've got any ideas for any upcoming shows, 
leave it down in the comments. We will definitely check those out. And uh, yeah, so let's get back into it here. So I got this picture from later on. Oh, okay, super last thing. There's always gotta be a super last thing. If you'd like to join our Discord and you'd like to talk to us at some point throughout the week, uh, you can go to sinshop.org forward slash Discord. All right. I used to have a really hard time remembering that. And so that's, that's, that's what's behind that whole thing. Okay. But yes, go to sin slash Discord. <laughs> there you go. And uh, uh, go there and uh, you can, you can, there's a little link there. You can join our Discord and, uh, and uh, say hi. And, you know, hopefully one day come down and check out the shop. Okay, back into it. Here we go. This picture was from a little bit uh, later originally, but I included it here to show some of your wiring work since we were talking about the, the rooftop stuff. And one thing that I noticed in a lot of your pictures, there was this orange. Let's see, is that picture up yet? Yeah. There's this orange stuff. Is that like <laughs> sealant or great stuff or what is that? So it's... Uh contractor version of great stuff i mean it literally is the great stuff brand but i don't know why they dye contractor stuff orange i think i mean i know there's significance to orange in that it has fire resistance i think um you know i don't think the stuff i buy is billed as the fire resistant kind but maybe the i don't know it's just it's you know the gaps and cracks whatever but the one the one it's the one that can you screw into the gun and it's way more controllable um for whatever reason, it's orange. From someone that used to do construction, it's probably either fire retardant or just so that the contractor knows you bought the good stuff. <laughs> it's not, it's not, pretty not obvious to know if you bought the good stuff not or the contract. bad stuff, just sorry. by how smooth it is. Right, not not contractor, I'm sorry, the city inspector. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> but, you know, if it's at a home or, you know, office or something like that. So, okay, flooring. Uh, so this is what we were, uh, a little bit of what we were talking about earlier. What kind of tile do you use for the vehicle uh so my preference that i've i've done on i guess all three vans is uh just snap together vinyl oh. um on, on the first van it was you know the cheap junk from home depot which uh -huh. is cheap and um junk. but you know the moment you walk on it with a pebble in your shoe you're just like gouging the hell out of it Ugh, okay. um, and so you know if you're willing to spend a little more money on it and go to an actual flooring store and get something with you know, the, uh, I think they call it like the wear layer or something. You can see it's a pretty significant clear layer on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've had it in van number two for, you know, three or four years now. You know, I, I would be hard pressed to find a scratch in it. Oh, that's awesome. Um, but, you know, it's the big downside is that <clears throat> it does swell a little bit. You know, the cheap stuff swells way more than the good stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember... I remember the first van, I would have to be careful about letting the door hang open and, you know, the sliding door, let it open in the sun. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd come back to just bubbles in the floor. Mm. Um, you know, if you're careful, you can get it cooled off and they'll like kind of contract back together. Um, the good stuff I have, you know, I've let it sit in the sun and I don't really have any swelling issues. So, you know, they always say, um, be careful about, you know, tacking down the edges. You always want to leave it floating and everything because it'll swell. Mm. Um, I've got a few spots where I've, I've actually kind of locked it into place. And, you know, nervously knowing that it might swell and I've had it everything from, you know, I've camped out in 30 below zero all the way up to, you know, desert, desert summer. So, and I've just, I've not had any issue with the good stuff. That's cool. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in buy once, cry once. You get the, <laughs> you get the good stuff at the beginning and you won't be sad later. So, so you don't, so there's no issues then with the flexing and all that. I guess it's kind of mint. I mean, it's. I could, I could see it being a problem with the way that a typical house is, is only going to, uh, you know, you're going to get in it. And unless there's a problem with the heating or the cooling, it's going to be 70 something degrees year round, pretty much. Right. Whereas you are going out into who knows where, maybe it's 10 below, maybe it's 120, you know, you're going through a lot of different climates with this, right? Right. And humidity is the big one, too. Oh, you know, a lot of, yeah. you know, wood products just swell like you wouldn't imagine it, you know, more than you'd ever realize in your house. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm from St. Louis. My, my last house <laughs> was uh, was built that, that I lived in before I came out here was built in 1896. And there wasn't a square wall to floor in the whole entire place. It was just, you know, 100 years of. So. It's a technical. But. Thing. But no, I mean, as far as floor flex, you know, it's not something I really, really worry about too much. I mean, these things are, you know, they're they're kind of rigid. You know, they're, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a, like a unibody. I don't know what they would actually call the, the van, but it's frameless. 
you yeah, know they're just built like a big steel box and they don't you know it kind of kind of bites you when you're actually trying to do any sort of you know technical driving like off-road driving or anything because you know there's no frame you know it's 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 yeah. really easy to get a wheel off the ground and lose all your traction yes absolutely yeah i have a uh i have a cherokee a xj and yeah no you, every time i go up a hill or something like that i feel the whole thing just undulating you know just <laughs> rrr, 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 rrr. So I, I see here the the picture. I don't think it's made it to the stream yet, but I've got the picture in there with the uh, bottle of uh, it looks like a glass of wine there at the end. <laughs> That's like yeah, yeah. Oh, it was just uh, you know, every now and then you you, you work tediously towards something and nothing visually changes. Huh. And uh, yes, you know, I'm kind of at that phase right now, honestly, where you just you just work for days and days and days, and you still look at it and you're like, not a damn thing has changed. Uh -huh. And so that was one of those things where I wasn't really ready to put the floor in yet, but it's like I'm just sick of this thing looking the same. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, well, let's put the floor. And you know, it's a you know a half day's worth of work, but everything changes all of a sudden. Uh -huh. And it's like, all right, well, something changed. Time to just take a break and kind of kick back for a minute. And, what's what's um, that? What's that expression? There's there's years where nothing happens and there's weeks where decades happen, something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely that feeling where every now and then you just have to put, put one thing down, go do something visual just to kind of boost your spirits a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. I like your wiring job. Is that, is that, did you actually like take the time to lace that? No. So that's, that's, that's actually not mine. That's a factory wiring harness. It's, it's the bane of everyone who converts a transits experience i mean they oh, yeah. for whatever reason they run the wiring harness to the rear of the van on the inside of the you know, the cargo space um hmm. so it's just snaked along there so you got to start unhooking it and then you got to start figuring out how to hide it um, uh, there's a few guys out there who have figured out a way to either one cut it you know there's probably 30 wires in there so you cut it and recrimp them all back together uh -huh. um or That'll you work. can or you can start unhooking it from everything and start re you know pull it back and try to snake it through and hope everything ever hope everything reaches once you get it back through there so it looks like you went um, with the re-snaking option or no i've so i can pretty much hide it the second van i uh kind of figured out where you wouldn't know it's there so i run you know set of cabinetry along the driver's side from about the driver's seat back mm -hmm. um run it about halfway and then kind of the wall panel that i use is a it's a policy polyiso cyanate or whatever it's called um, so i use the one inch up there and one inch is just big enough that you can form a groove in the back reinforce it with some contact adhesive and then using that groove you can kind of hide that wiring harness behind it oh, um, okay and then once you get it to the back you stuff it up around the ceiling you can you have to kind of pull and stretch and kind of work it into place but you can get it hidden hmm. okay oh wait a minute okay you go away uh, do, 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 do. sorry, something jumped around. Okay, so to the point where when I was looking through the pictures, I was like, oh, he did that, huh? <laughs> the job. So I used to have, what was it? I think it was a, what was it? Oh, I, I had a Scion XB and there was an aftermarket sunroof kit that you could get. And I was like, wait a minute, you mean to tell me I'm going to cut a hole in my roof? And I, was, and I was like, you know, oh, oh no, it's really easy. You, you have a template. You're going to just lay down that template and then you just cut there. I'm like, I'm going to get that template straight. Is that what we're, about, we're, we're saying? <laughs> so when I saw this picture, I was like, oh, damn, he did it. <laughs> so, so first of all, I mean, you know, what are you going to do? If you want a window, you're, you're going to have to have that. So, so how did you, what was your process here? You know, did you get the template from them or, or did you make like, we're looking at the cardboard template now. Um, did you make that yourself? Like, yeah, was... man, that's definitely a process that's a pretty high pucker factor. Oh, yeah. You, um, you know, you make your template. Um, you know, the unfortunate thing is, you know, the contour lines on the outside of the van don't necessarily line up with the contour lines on the inside of the van. Oh boy! And so it's it's kind of a decision of, well, do you want the window to look straight from the outside or look straight from the inside? Um, yeah, right. It also looks like you have like some of the uh, support beam type stuff in the way yeah. there too yeah yeah so those you know they they make one body and you know for both the cargo van and the passenger van so you know that's all pre-stamped from the factory for the option of a window you know i don't know how it's actually put together in the factory but you know the option they 
somehow probably stamp it out and cut it and then just glue in a factory window for the passenger version. Uh, so it's all a relatively minimal effort to actually get that out. Mm -hmm. um, you just got to tediously kind of cut those reinforcements, um, get your template up there, figure out, you know, kind of my trick was to kind of ease into the situation was figure out kind of where I wanted the template, take a, take a punch from the inside, punch, kind of give myself a reference point that I could, you know, punch and just put a dent in it, just a really sharp dent that wasn't enough to crack the paint on the outside. Mm, okay. Uh oh. Reference points lined up from that dent and then, then kind of re-template it from the outside and then commit. You you dropped out briefly, so you make the the one punch on one side, and I guess you make another punch elsewhere on the template so that you get them get the two lined up. Oh, well, you just take just punch the sheet metal just to give yourself a dimple, right. just to have some sort of point of reference in the middle of that body, just because it's it's hard reference off of you know the lines because the lines are all curves and you know it's, you know, it's a quarter inch curve, so you don't mm -hmm. know like well what part of the quarter inch am I measuring from the inside versus the outside. And, so if you just kind of put a dimple in the sheet metal, you know, something, if, if you totally screw it up and you got a bail on it, it's one dimple and no one will hopefully notice, but right. it gives yourself kind of a point of reference that you can kind of like, you know, figure out the rest of your points from both the inside and outside. Wow. Yeah. So, the, so was there not a, well, so I guess on, on that one, that was probably more a, was it, I don't want to take this to a body shop to do it situation? Or was it a, I want to do this just to say I did it? Was it no other option was available? Like, how, what was the decision on that? Like, uh, Knowing the quality of so-called professional work um, and knowing that I would rather do it myself so I know that the edges are sealed and it's not going to rust out on me in a couple of years. Oh, okay. Because um, there's, you know, there's some big expensive you know the winnebago rv that there's a facebook group where everyone's just just going crazy that the window cutouts and the, the wall cutouts are just rusting out on them because whatever at the winnebago factory they didn't seal the, the steel edges for whatever reason so wow. it's just observing enough of that going on that it was like you know i i want to do this myself i want to make sure i know that it's done right on on such a critical piece yeah yeah you're doing everything else on the van as well so i mean that's not really that much more so yeah, I, I've I've never been one to hire out anything. I, mean, I guess that's kind of I grew up kind of in in the boonies in Kansas, and you know that's just how I was raised to just figure it out yourself. And so it's just kind of I don't even really consider hiring something done. Huh? I don't know. I I don't know if I would. I don't know if I would cut into the <laughs> in the side. I don't know. I, I, I'm I don't, I don't have to lie to kick it. I'm just, <laughs> I, I'll I'll admit when I, when something's too much. So I see here later on in the process, you've actually cut out those support beams is, I mean, I guess you were saying before that the vehicle's made to have a window there. So it's not, mm -hmm. that doesn't really pose a issue. Yeah. Those aren't so much structural as they are just dampening of that big panel of sheet metal. Um, yeah. so the structural ones are obviously the big ones. And you sure. certainly don't cut those. And those are even a, Oh, I, I forget the steel terminology, but those are even made of a, you know, a high gray, like super hard steel that if you, I've even tried drilling a hole in one in, in the current van and like you mm -hmm. ruin a lot of bits trying to get one hole in one. Um, mm -hmm. So they're, they're reinforced steel. Um, just those little supports, they're, they're basically just baffling to keep that panel from just turning into a drum going down the road. God, that would be annoying. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. That, that is really cool, man. Like, so I see here, like the, in some of the later pictures, we've got the little shade that comes down over the uh over the window that's that's neat is this a custom thing is this a window specifically made for the transit or is it just something that you saw and you were like hey that'll fit no that's uh it's it's eurovision window. so they're imported from europe mm -hmm. um it's kind of weird the european rv market in a lot of ways is light years ahead of the american market i mean hmm. i think as americans we always think like oh we're the like rv capital of the world but <laughs> Um, the European RVs, there's there's some really cool stuff that they're doing that, you know, when you actually go look at some American RVs, like our stuff's just junk a lot of times. Really? Um, but the, you're custom for the transit. There are a handful of windows out there. Um, a lot of them are just single pane glass. Um, 
simple. A lot of them are just some of them look factory. I mean, they have really nice looks. They're really aesthetically pleasing, mm -hmm. um, but they're just cold. They let a lot of air through. Uh, and I found this and I have a friend that has a camper topper, you know, slide in camper in his truck that mm -hmm. has one of these windows in it. So I went and studied it and looked at it, found a supplier in the U.S. that was importing them and kind of made the jump and bought one to, to test it out. That's cool. And then we got a, uh, a side shot here outside the, uh, in the back of the shop showing the, the finished project. It's a little crooked. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's <laughs> just a little bit. It's too late now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're like too bad guy. <laughs> this is, this is what we're getting. No, that My favorite thing to do is to make something absolutely perfect and then tell someone it's crooked. Yeah. <laughs> Just, just to set off their their OCD, <laughs> even though it isn't actually crooked. <laughs> oh man, yeah. So here's a here's another shot too of you uh, getting the uh, power. It looks like it's the power hookup. Yeah. So the other two, the other two holes on the side I had to make were one for the the power port, mm -hmm. um, and then the other one was for the water fill. So those were. They were a little bit of a pain in the butt because they were down low where you can kind of see that curve on the side of the van. It's a, it's a fairly significant contour that you sort of have to, you know, you have to figure out just how much shimming you want. You feel like doing that day. So you either like lower it where it's a little bit flatter or you raise it. You can just kind of like play around with where you want it hmm. um, and then get it in there and then just start sealing it up. And that is that for charging somewhere that has power or is that for, uh, running power outside of the vehicle uh the former so it's for you know if you you know, i don't think i'll have too many power issues in this van just with the way i got it set up mm -hmm. but you know it's always nice to have that option if you you know I've, I've been somewhere where it was just like snowing and 10 below zero non-stop and my panels iced over and i couldn't charge and i was just getting pretty depleted on power and it's just really nice to just if you know someone in the area, or if you can figure out a place to go plug in, just to go plug in for an afternoon, top off. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, if you, depending on what your situation is, if you're if you're somewhere where you're staying at a friend's house for a while or something, and you would rather run a space heater instead of your you know, fancy gasoline heater, you know, if you can simplify things just by plugging in, then it's nice. And it's, it's such a low effort thing to just go ahead and run that port outside. I mean, I've already got a charger, like an inverter charger that... Mm -hmm has the option so it's just you know just committing to just punching that hole in the side of the van putting a port is is one of the easier things to do oh, that's wild amp bridge is that uh plug uh that's a 30 amp so it's okay. it's i didn't realize going into this that there are so many different standards in rv plugs there's locking there's non-locking there's 20 30 80 50 there's all sorts of different amperages i was gonna say it um, looks like a locking c30 to me yeah, I only discovered all this until I ordered, I think, three different options off Amazon, realizing that they were all the wrong ones. Oof. No fun. This looks like a, a standard L630 there, really. So. Oh, L630. I was going to say a C30. So L means it's locking, 6 means it's like 240. Well, uh, 5 would be 110. Huh. i got to figure out what... What the heck I was talking about was a C30. Maybe that's uh, the whip receptacles, maybe? I don't know. Maybe I got it wrong. But, um, so my favorite part of this, I think, uh, of, of your pictures, I think the thing that, that really uh, uh, surprised me the most was your English wheel setup. <laughs> that's awesome. I've got I got a picture of it, the, the close-up one of it here. So... Uh, for anybody that doesn't isn't aware of what an English wheel is, it's basically two wheels, typically steel, and I'll come back to that in a second, that are pushed together, and you take your your metal part and you push it through that, and it helps you to basically shape it. Um, that's how if you've got like a custom car place and you're making a fender for an old car or a or a gas a gas tank for a motorcycle, that's how you get some of those bends in in sheet metal without having a big old machine to stamp it. So. I, I, I saw that that picture happened to be right next to something for the stove. Is that why you made the English wheel? Yeah. And I mean, I don't know if it's even, if it was even successful enough to be worth talking about. I mean, I think it did help. 
Um, but the stove is a kind of like a scratch and dent off eBay. I don't I don't know exactly what the backstory behind this is, but there's a, a set of accounts or whatever they are on eBay, a set of people out there that sell things from the RV market that, you know, I don't know if they get dropped or something happens to the RV. I don't know what it is, but they're brand new units. Hmm. Um, looking at it, it looks like it's even been hooked up before and mm-hmm. it's been pulled out. So I don't know. I don't know what happens that they get scratch and dented, but. Um, you know, this one is a Furion, Furion, whatever. Okay. Um, it's like a $700 stove oven thing. It's like a really high end unit. And I got it for, I think two fifty or something. Hmm. Um, with the caveat being that, that stainless steel shroud on the, on the, uh, it's kind of man- mangled and ugly. Um, you know, so I made like a little, like you know, I made a little like oak stick to kind of hammer it out and try to smooth some of the ripples out. And I got it mostly smooth. And then I thought, you know, I knew what an English wheel was. I never used one. I certainly didn't have access to one. Um, but I know there's a box of about a thousand casters in the shop. So I thought, well, I don't have anything to lose. So I smoothed one of the, or two of the casters out and put them on the press. And it did help. I mean, it, you can definitely tell that it, it kind of smoothed out some of the ripple. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, I, it was kind of to the point of diminishing returns and, wanting to move on to something else so i called it and then um you know rebuffed it. it's brushed stainless steel so i took sandpaper and went through the whole process and like brushed it back all mm-hmm. all straight again and it looks good enough i mean you can still see it but it's a lot better than it was that's awesome it's nothing else close enough for government work and and you know now the shop has a uh, has an english wheel kind of <laughs> so did you well okay so i was gonna ask if, if... it was metal wheels Sorry, what was that? The metal casters we had. Yeah, I saw those. I, I don't know. I knew those were there. And I, I didn't want to take a chance of ruining the good metal casters that could be used for something else when we had all the. I mean, there's literally a box of I don't know how many dozens in there of the plastic ones. A friend of mine, I kill. So. Say, say again. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, she helps with the group that does all the lighting and fancy stuff for DEF CON. Uh-huh. And so those actually came off of their big storage crates that they had like upgraded the wheels on, but they didn't want to throw out the old wheels, so they, they got donated to the shop. Oh, so, neat. Cool. Okay. So I'm sure she'll be happy to find out that they got repurposed for an interesting purpose. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I was I was wondering I saw, when I saw that I was like, well, I don't I don't fully understand how that's going to reshape the metal because plastic last time I checked is weaker than metal, but I mean if it if it smoothed it out somewhat, that's at least you know at least we have a uh, like a uh, uh, um, a low setting for the English wheel basically. <laughs> yeah, I mean the caster, you know, the rubber plastic stuff on casters is pretty rigid. Mm, um, okay. And, you know, it, it's, I don't know what gauge, I don't know my gauge is on stainless, but it's a pretty thin gauge stainless. So, it you know, it, it made a difference, but huh. I don't know if it was due to lack of English wheel or lack of technique, but it, it did something. There we go. Okay. I, I got to try that now. Because I, I, I had a very, very passing interest. I was going to, like, make a fender for a, for a mini bike that I had. And I, like... I had the one I was going to get all picked out. I, what, what what was that? Was it, it was either Harbor Freight or like the Grizzly catalog. I was like, yeah, that's not that much money. I could get that and then do this and blah, blah, blah. I was like, no, let's hold on. Let's pause. You're going to have a, even more floor space in the garage taken up with something you are never going to use ever other than one afternoon, maybe. Stop it. And so I didn't do that. <laughs> but but this is interesting, like having this here. Like we, I, I really think we should look at... Uh, getting those metal casters and making some kind of fitting that goes on that. Cause that's like, that's a really clever use of that five ton press. I love it. <laughs> so, so something else that, uh, you know, I was talking before about how my dad never touched, uh, uh, body work. There was, there was also upholstery. My mm-hmm. mom helped him out with one project. It was a 37 Chevy, but whatever, that's a whole nother story. But, um, I noticed that, that you did a lot of your own stuff here. So I see there's a, a lot of, we'll get to the to the headliner here in just a second, but uh, a lot of the insulation there. Um, is that something that's normally used in cars or was that something from a home that was adapted or like? Um, so the, the reflective 
Yeah. Well, I guess as far as the reflective stuff goes, the photo has two different things. One of them, the big sheet good is poly, polyisocyanate. Um, you can buy it at you know a select few like Home Depots and stuff around. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's basically it's like squirt foam in sheet form. Um, you know, it's a closed cell foam um, sided on both sides with a with a non porous layer. Hmm. Um, you can buy it in half inch, one inch, two inch. Um, and so that's what the big sheets are. And on the roof, you can see that, um, you know, it's got to form the curve and it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of flexible if you push it. I mean, it's not meant to be flexible, but if you push it and glue it into place and hold it there, you know, shim it up with sticks while the glue forms mm -hmm. or with the, you know, the squirt foam cures, you know, hold it into place. And then the, along the contours, uh, I can't remember what, what the product is called, but one of the brand names is Easy Cool. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of sold to like the, you know, the, the hot rod market or whatever, you know, people trying to like insulate old cars and, you know, insulate firewalls and that sort of stuff, mm. insulate floorboards. Mm -hmm. So it's sold to that. It's a, you know, it's kind of a glorified bubble wrap in a lot of ways. It's, it's a lot finer, more of a foam like bubble wrap okay. um, kind of stuff. You know, it's not the stuff you can buy at Home Depot. That's Reflectix. And that literally is just bubble wrap wrapped with Mylar. Oh, really? Um, you know, that stuff that wouldn't do anything here. And, you know, there, there's a big, you know, religious debate out there on the forums of, gluing you know reflective foam like this to surfaces and how you know they're designed to get their r value from air gaps and if you glue it you know some people say it doesn't do anything I mean, it, it's a big religious debate out there that is best avoided um yeah, but i can confirm you know it's the first van i didn't do any of it you know i did all the paneling and stuff but i had just a select few metal bits that were still exposed okay and you know when it's below zero outside it doesn't matter how much heat you have going inside those metal bits are just like icicles shooting out of them. Mm. Um, so whatever, you know, just a thin layer of the easy cool stuff with fabric glued over it. Um, you know, technically R value wise, it's probably, you know, a fraction, but you know, when you're standing there next to it, it bare makes metal. all the difference in the world. Yeah. Bare metal directly to the outside. Absolutely. Is that what you're going to say, Crux? Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot better than bare, better metal. Bare yeah. metal is just going to be a giant heat sink. So yeah. Yeah or a radiator <laughs> yeah the hot the hot's going to the cold for sure <laughs> so i noticed too that you did I mean, sorry i'm moving moving windows around there there we go i noticed also that you did your own like headliner stuff that's that's an art <laughs> like, so did you like know how to do that already or was that self-taught as well no just winging it um you know take your time and wing it and be willing to pull it off if you screw it up um but you know it's that's uh it's so it's it's called a carpet it's called like a four-way stretch carpet but it has you know nothing in common with a carpet it's meant for like trunk liner it's right. uh, more of like a felted fabric stuff mm -hmm. um and it is it is extremely stretchy you know I, i've not yet ripped a piece you know just forcing into some corners and you know just using lots and lots of uh you know contact cement letting it get good and tacky and then you just slowly working into place you know mm. if you screw up pull it off quickly because it sets the uh, stuff sets fast yeah um, and then you just push it work it and you know you get it into the contours and uh, you know as long as you're careful it comes out looking you know relatively decent yeah i'm looking at the stuff it looks like that's over one of the doors probably in the back and that uh, yeah that, that looks so good man that looks factory no oh, thank you yeah really good work and, you know, as I was going through these, you know, at first when, when I was talking to you, you know, about coming on the show, I hadn't even, I hadn't seen the van in, you know, this far along. And, you know, people were, were, were telling me that it was, you know, it was really good. And so when I saw these pictures, I was like, oh, this is really good. This is going to be a cool show. So <laughs> definitely glad to, glad to have them for sure. So what's, what was happening in this picture here? I see you've got like a, a uh, board that's clamped across the top. I don't know if you see it on the stream yet, but. Well, not yet. I got back doors open in, inside the shop. Um, it's the same picture. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. So that is to find a point of reference. Um, if a level point of, well, not level, I guess a straight across point of reference. Mm. But, you know, everything, probably the most challenging thing about building a van out is there are no straight or level surfaces. Oh, yeah. um, you know, I... I think in an ideal world, if I had a shop where I could, if I could park the van for the entire duration of the build, I would consider getting a set of floor jacks and like literally leveling the van. 
um, sure, yeah. getting an absolute level. And then you can just build it like a house, use a level, use a plumb line, use, use normal technique. Mm. Um, but outside of that, you know, there's not a flat surface. There's not a level surface. So the board across the top was when I started working on ceiling cabinets, you know, the roof has a curve, the wall has a curve. There's just, there's no way to know what is straight across, yeah. what is up and down. So basically my technique as you're walking around, you know, cause it's on springs. So. <laughs> and, and so my technique was get, you know, find a board, find a, you know, one by two or whatever it was that was nice and straight, cut it to size, mount it on, on even surfaces on both sides, you know, find matching points on both sides, clamp it there. And then I've got myself a horizontal line I can start building off of. And then I can take that, start doing right angles to the ceiling. You know, I can start finding center lines in the ceiling. I can right. start like finding my center work out. And I can find like, myself a, you know, a reference plane that I can start building things from. Mm. Yeah, I, I I hadn't even thought about that until you just said it because yeah, it's not like you can use a plumb bob or a level in a car because every time you take a step, you're changing the you know elevation, you're changing the yaw and pitch or whatever, however you put it <laughs> of, of the car. So that's yeah, no, that's interesting. That is that would be the way to do it. I wonder if you did that, would the car even be well? It's not going to be square, but it, I guess at least it'd be consistent. Is the thing you could get the floor level. But, but that's about it. Yeah. Cause it's, it's kind of made, how do I put this? Because they have to put so much into it being aerodynamic, so on, so on and so forth. They kind of can't make it just a rigid box. There's going to be some, you know, tapering off at the top or, you know. And, and it, it tapers going forward. I mean, the width oh. of the front of the van is not the same as the width of the back of the van. The height of the front's not the same as the height of the back. I mean, oh it's yeah. like you say for aerodynamics, aesthetics, whatever they do it for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every step of the way, you're you're redoing your lines, redoing your measurements, and, and doing contours the whole way. And you know, a big part of my, I guess, education is boat building channels. I mean, people are building people have been building boats for a lot longer than building vans and RVs. So Huh. Um, you know, I, I have a handful of kind of wooden boat building channels, fiberglass boat, you know, boat refit channels and just yeah. studying how people deal with curves on boats because they don't make square boats very often. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of transferring some of that technique, you know, how to score a line on a curve and how do I build a cabinet that fits to a curve and you know, kind of learning some of that technique has been really fascinating. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, so actually I think probably cabinetry is going to be next if I'm not mistaken. It is. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to talk about cabinetry next, but I just realized I've been, I've been sitting here like watching this, this whole project and all this and talking to you about it. I just realized we just blew right past the bottom of the hour. So I think what we should probably do, you guys, can you guys use a break, like quick five minute break. Yeah, sure. I'm good. Break, uh, getting something to, something to drink. And... That's the one right there. Yes, I definitely am in need of a, of a new beverage and uh, and all that stuff. So why don't we do that? We'll take like about a five, maybe 10 minute break tops uh, and, uh, you know, go refresh some beverages. When we come back, we are going to talk about uh, so water systems. We're going to talk about interior cabinetry, uh, why you didn't just go to Ikea. <laughs> Lots of reasons. <laughs> You're like, oh, you <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, ventilation panels. Oh, pan the panels are actually one of my favorite things. I freaking love your panels. They're great. Um, so yeah, we're going to go talk a little bit about that and, and much, much more on our post.